Justin, what is up? Welcome to the podcast. Dan, thanks so much for having me, man. I'm excited to, to chat. Yes, sir. Um, so I, uh, through my research, you know, like you just basically have come up as, as I would consider you to be fascinating because um, there, there are certain things about you. Like number one is like you actually built two multi eight figure businesses. Uh, and then at, at some point in time, you actually were, you, you can actually tell the story a little bit later, but you, you got burnt out. And then now it's like you've gravitated towards doing uh, this solo one person business that generates over seven figures. And one of the things that uh, I was wondering is, you know, why exactly did you decide to make the jump in the first place? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, the, the answer is I had to, um, you know, I had been my, my story without going into the long and the, the long version is, uh, I was in, I failed the first six years of my career from 2003 to 2009. I just wasn't very good at any of the jobs that I got, but, uh, in 2009, that sort of all changed. I got hired as the first salesperson at a tech company in New York. Uh, everything just sort of clicked for me without going into the details, just like right maturity, right team, right product, right city, right environment, right culture. Everything just like intersected at once and had a really good run five years there, parlayed that into an executive role, became the VP of sales of a, a very, very small pre-revenue company, um, grew that company from its first dollar in revenue to over 50 million in recurring. And at the conclusion of that, I'd been there for five years. I had worked for 10 consecutive years in high growth startup environments, five of that as an executive in the last two at the first business working for the CEO. So it was very, very uh, high strung and I just burned out like for, for lack of a better or, or you know, a more interesting story, um, you know, 10 years of anxiety, five, six years of board meetings, hit, trying to hit your targets one quarter after another quarter after another quarter. And it just sort of culminated in this panic attack in late 2018. Um, I was really overweight. I wasn't eating well. I was drinking too much. I wasn't sleeping very much. And I had this panic attack. And that was the beginning of telling my boss that I, I was going to leave. Uh, stayed on for another seven or eight months and uh, then stepped down. Mostly just because I had to. Like I had to get my health in order. I had to get my family in order. I had to get all the things in order. And I thought that I would work for myself for like 12 months. Um, you know, that was three years ago. So <laughs> that's why. So a lot of people, you know, even after like the panic attack, they would rationalize themselves to stay in the company, to grind it out. And for you, you, you took a complete pivot towards uh, what you're doing right now. Um, so was it, was it more so like the health or actually it could have been multifactorial. This was like the health, uh, the lack of time that you had with family and, and kind of like the way that you're treating your body. Is that what kind of like led you to be like, I, I want to do something completely different than what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and when I made that change, um, I did what most people do who step out of an executive role at a startup company. Um, at, at that point I was chief revenue officer. I let, I stepped down and I had this nice title. I had a great uh, career, um, I had been at two really prominent companies in the same space, which was healthcare technology. So it was really easy for me to go out and say, I'm going to be a consultant or advisor to early stage healthcare IT companies. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. So even that transition out of that, that business into working for myself was not even what I do today, which is significantly different than, you know, consulting and advising for healthcare companies. Um, but again, that was like, I had envisioned that as a, a, a short break uh, just a, a, a rest period between, you know, going back to work for another company similar to the ones that I had worked for before. I think the interesting thing that happened was I just really enjoyed working for myself, not so much as a consultant, but as I started to like figure out social media, I started to really enjoy that aspect of it. And so that's sort of how I got to run the businesses that I run today, which are completely not associated with the last 16 years of my professional career, um, but I'm having a lot more fun doing it. Awesome. So what, what type of businesses are, are we talking about right now? So from, from my perspective, it's like right now you're building the brand, uh, Justin Walsh. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also you have uh, kind of like this, this I, I like to call it like a product suite, but, but you almost have these like uh, this recurring flywheel of, uh, of different businesses that you're currently running. So 
So which ones are the ones that uh, you're talking about right now? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I have is a free newsletter, which has about 36,000 subscribers, but I sell sponsorships inside of that newsletter. So that's sort of small revenue stream one. And that's what I would call like its own distinct, you know, revenue unit or business. Um, I have two digital products that I sell. Uh, and that makes up the bulk of my revenue. And so those products are mostly around learning how to use LinkedIn the way that I used it for three years, and then learning how to create uh, basically systematized content processes. So that's a, another uh, information product that I sell that that sort of makes up a second business. Then I have a coaching package as well, where I help uh, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, creators, you know, take advantage of, you know, mostly text based social media platforms. Cause that's, I'm a writer before I'm anything else. And so uh, that's sort of a third area. I had a private community for 18 months that had 700 plus members across 61 countries. I recently shut that down and we can, we can dive into why I, I made that choice, but that was number four. I still advise early stage SaaS companies in the healthcare space. Like I, I still am connected to a lot of VCs, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, funds, a lot of prior executives. So I still land clients, you know, there. And then like, I'm an affiliate for a ton of different products that I, I use and enjoy. So that's five and six. And there's probably some other things in there that I do that I'm not thinking about at the moment, but like generally five to six different revenue streams operating all at one time. Okay. So I, I knew that you were getting into like the community aspect of things. So, so why did you decide to drop the community then? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of us felt pressure to start a community because like we live in an ecosystem, like an echo chamber in Twitter where it's like community led growth. Everything's community. If you don't have a community, you're going to fail, 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 fail. Um, and so when we read things like that, I think at least my natural inclination is to, is FOMO, right? I don't want to miss out on that. I don't want to, you know, um, miss the next big thing that helps you grow your business. Uh, so I launched a community in April or May of last year, I think it was. Yeah, maybe maybe a little earlier. Um, really aligned with folks who wanted to do something similar to what I'm doing, which is leverage social media, their brand, build a following, and use that to make either a little bit of extra income or something where they can eventually leave their job, sort of, sort of like I did. Uh, loved it. Had a blast. Grew really fast. Had a ton of great events. The, the reason that I left it is just my personality. Um, I am what you might consider, consider, uh, extremely high strung, um, uh, fill, I filled with anxiety, uh, very much performance based, like very type a, I don't really know, like, I don't really know how to relax. Like I, I'm not like the kind of guy who's going to like lay down on the couch or take a nap or, or all those different things. And so what happened that I hadn't anticipated is, you know, I'll get a, a day like today where after this podcast, I might have a hour, hour and a half break before the next thing that I have to do. And rather being than, than being able to enjoy that break, um, you know, the community itself is 24 seven. It's always there. It's always on. So I always felt like I had to go in and like do something. So I never felt, you know, like I had time off. And so I decided to make a, a change and, and shut it down. Yeah. I, I felt that I started a community last year and it was running well. Uh, I had my coaching business at the same time. And it's like, it's almost like you have these like two competing things for your attention as well. It's like mm -hmm. your coaching clients are requiring you to kind of like, uh, you know, you know, answer your questions and to give your support to them. And then at the same time, you have like this bevy of people in your community. And one of the reasons I did it, I, I was actually advised to do it. And they're like, you need like a recurring revenue model. You got to do this and you got to do that. And anytime that, uh, anytime like, I feel like I need to do something or I have to do something. That's probably like a good sign that I shouldn't be doing it. And if it's for something for something like revenue or even if like a recurring revenue model or something like that. So totally get where you're coming from when it comes to that. And uh, now, right now you're running this like solo one person uh, business. Uh, first of all, I want to know what the definition of a one person business is. Like, does this include VAs? Uh, do you have some people under you, but like contractors, like what does that look like? No, just a virtual assistant. Okay. Yeah. I have okay. no, no employees and no contractors. Like, gotcha. and it's funny because I think a lot of times, and by the way, I, I, um, I can appreciate people's skepticism because I'm a skeptical person in general, but like people are always like, oh, you comment back to a lot of things on social media or you're, you post every day. Like someone has to do your content or re reply on your behalf. It's just me. So, yeah. uh, my virtual assistant really handles, um, 
mostly email scheduling. Uh, and she's pretty new. I did this all myself for the the longest time. And my wife, by the way, is extremely supportive and every once in a while helps send an email or something if I need some help. But for the most part, it's just me. Gotcha. Does she handle like content distribution as well? Say from like LinkedIn to like Instagram or anything like it's, it's all you. All yeah. All oh. she has her own business on LinkedIn. She does her own content every day. Wow. Um, has her own digital products, coaching services. So my wife is busy with with her stuff. So uh, she she lets me handle mine. That's that's amazing. And I, and I figure that you do that because it's kind of like LinkedIn and also Twitter and maybe mm-hmm. even now like Instagram is is kind of like your golden goose a little bit. Like you don't want to have other people's hands in there. You want to be there and get your hands dirty, be kind of like at the forefront of that. I, I'm just guessing though. Yeah. I'm. It's two things. It's, I think anytime you outsource something, you generally learn less about mm. the process. Um, because I think internal knowledge is like in, in actually having your, like rolling your sleeves up and having your hands in it, I think is, is really important. And second, I'm just a control freak by nature. Like, um, I don't like mis- like, and, and maybe this will come off sounding really strange, but I might as well just say it. Like, I don't love mistakes. I don't like, I was 30 seconds late to this podcast. I'm not even usually 30 seconds late to something. Like I'm very rigid. I'm very like type A. And so I don't know, having someone like log in or do something on my behalf just wouldn't, I don't know, wouldn't sit well with me, I think. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Uh, okay. So we have like a one VA, but technically it's, you are running a, a solo business or a bus- mm-hmm. business on your own now. Were there any lessons that you learned uh, growing and scaling these companies to, let's just say, over $50 million that you've carried along with you towards uh, your one-person business that's helped you? For sure. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. I think, and I'm I'm really fortunate to have had that background. Um, You know, I think the biggest thing is process and systems. So when I was at my first company, which was called ZocDoc in New York, um, they moved me across the country all over the place. LA, San Francisco, Boston. And I learned really to work on my own. So that was super helpful. Like being really autonomous, I think was a skill that I learned there. Nobody was telling me to do my work or sitting over my shoulder. I I managed field salespeople. So it's like I was on planes and trains every day Mm. on my own. My boss was back at headquarters. And so I think autonomy is really a skill that is helpful. Um, my second job, Patient Pop, where I became the VP of sales and then eventually the chief revenue officer, I went from you know a team of two or three to a team of 140 over the course of five years. And when you scale a team from one to 140 people, and suddenly you've got four different departments that report up to you, you recognize that it's not really about being you know in the business, it's working on the business. And part of the business is process and systems. And so I have a very process and system driven approach to not just my business, but also my content, um, the way that I work on social media every day. I very rarely wake up and I'm like, oh, let's try this new interesting ad hoc thing. Like mm. everything is very planned. Everything is very systematized. And I I relate that back to my most recent job. Okay. So let's just uh, take this process oriented uh, focus to say creating courses. So let's just say um, you, know, you are to create a course. What is the process that, and I'm actually totally asking this from a, a selfish point of view because I'm, sure. I'm getting into products like a little bit later. And uh, so what would your process be to, uh, I guess there's like a couple of things from like product creation to marketing to sales, right? So yeah. w- what would your process be for uh, launch or actually creating it and launching it? Yeah. So the the very first thing that I do before I create anything is try and validate that there is in fact a need by simply doing some research. And that research is not like, I don't research like markets or stats or anything like I just go into my social media and in my in my uh, inbox and I start to read through all the form submissions on my website, all the emails that I get from people get get categorized, um, all the DMs that I have. And I just try and see if there's any commonalities amongst the questions that people ask. Mm-hmm. And by the way, you just notice that anyways over time if you're paying attention to your business, like and you're taking your own DMs and messages, which again is why I like to do it versus somebody else. It's like you start to see these common patterns. How do you do A? How do you do B? How do you do C? And then you look through those three questions and you notice, of people are asking how to do A. Okay, great. Well, that might be a really good opportunity for uh, a digital product. And so before I decide to go out and just build it, what what I'll typically do is I'll sort of whip up a coaching package around that. So let's say like, how to grow on Twitter. I'm just making this up. I'm not building a course on that. Um, But let's say like, that's that's what people are asking me. I would put together a coaching package. It's like, 
one to 5,000 Twitter followers in 90 days, $850 coaching package. And I'll do 15, 20 different coaching calls. And I'll start to look for the commonalities in those questions. Cause it's not just like, Hey man, how do you grow on Twitter? There are sub questions underneath that, right? Some people will be like, I'm trying to figure out how to pick a niche, build a profile. How do I do inbound marketing? How do I do outbound DMs on Twitter? There's all these sort of sub questions underneath that, that, that topic. And so just trying to figure out what are the most common questions that people have, concerns that people have that I'm trying to alleviate, and then it's figuring out the answers. Like what are the best solutions for those top eight to 10 questions that people might ask on a coaching call? Once you can do that on repeat where you're actually solving people's problems and you're seeing the win in the data, you're watching your coaching clients grow on Twitter in this example, then you know you've got something. You know you know what you're talking about. You know you have the right answers. Even though I've already grown on Twitter, I want to prove it on other people. And then once that's done, uh, before I decide to go out and build the course, I'll pre-sell it. So that's usually whipping up a landing page, um, you know, building out an offer in my course uh, website, which is run through Kajabi, putting together a quick mock-up in Canva, and then going out and I'll promote it for seven to 14 days via email, via LinkedIn, via Twitter. And essentially what I'm looking for is a threshold. And so if the course is 150 bucks and I sell 500 of those, then $75,000. And that's good enough to go spend a month building it out. And so once I've proven that there is in fact demand and I won't build anything, if there's no demand, you shouldn't build something if nobody's going to buy it. Uh, then I'll go through my course creation process, which is not that complicated. It is putting together an agenda, figuring out the right order in which to teach people. I build out all my slides first. I get my entire talk track done on simple PowerPoint shit, you know, like that's just how I do it and nothing high, high production value. Use Loom, turn on, uh, you know, my Loom camera and walk through the slides. And once I've walked through the slides, I try and think what are the actual resources people need to go execute on these things. And then I fill the course filled with resources. Amazing. Amazing. So let's just say, uh, you have a person with like an audience of mine. Um, you know, I've gotten into coaching right now and mm -hmm. I've, uh, you know, I've been you know, somewhat successful with it. Now, the next step is going to be product. Uh, or actually, let's just take someone that's like completely new, actually, as an audience. What would you say is the step by step uh, formula for them to create an online income for themselves, and to do so in a way where they can actually keep themselves at a one person business? Yeah. Are you suggesting that they don't have an audience yet? I'd say that they have like a, let's just say that they have a moderate audience of like 10 to 15 K people on, uh, on Twitter or something like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's no, there's no secret to it. I think the, I mean, the secret is, I guess if there, if there's like a secret, right. For, for lack of a better word is, um, you can be well known for something, but if there's not an appetite in the market for other people to learn that same thing, it's really hard to monetize. So for example, the, the general rule of thumb, and by the way, this doesn't always work. It's not perfect. Is like, you either have to help people make money, save money or save time for the most part, right? You can also help people get in better shape. You can also help people do things that are attached to relationships, fall in love, find a spouse. All those different things are generally things that people will want to learn. Mm. But I think, I think the, the idea of monetizing your knowledge is, and this sounds really strange, you have to have something that is different than every single other person inside of your niche or area of competency. And that usually has to be either a framework or system that you follow that you truly believe is 10 times better than any other framework process or system that's out there. I think my content process that I use to create 17 pieces of content in one day, including a long form newsletter is better than anybody else's. I truly believe that. That's why I sell it. Um, and so I think it's recognizing what that is inside of your area of competency. And then I think it's going out and using, you know, proven sort of copywriting and sales techniques to establish fear of missing out, right? Mm -hmm. It's to talk to your audience, the audience that's been following you. And if you've been building the right audience, they should want the thing that you have, and now it's time for you to say, here are all the problems that you experience. I'm amplifying all of your problems. There is some intriguing solution that I have. Here's your positive future if you adopt this solution. And here's the solution. Would you like to buy it or not? And I think that if you can do that really effectively, you probably have a product that people will buy. Interesting. So uh, 
would you suggest someone stay in their lane of, uh, I guess you could say like their, their niche, so to speak, or would you, you know, cause it's kind of like, um, let's just say this, like you have a product for fitness because you got your body in shape. Uh, you've also grown on Twitter, so you can actually help people uh, grow on Twitter using like this uh, specific framework and formula. Would would you say that's like expanding your brand too much, or would you kind of like uh, be like you can you can go to wherever you feel the audience wants to go at this very moment? I like to to go where the so so I can give my opinion right, but my opinion is not as important as what your audience tells you. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, let's take my own old business from 2019, where I came out of my job and I became a SaaS advisor and consultant. And in order to land clients for that consulting business, I wrote on LinkedIn every day. And I grew my following and grew my following and grew my following. And I was going to continue to do that business and start to build some courses for uh, executive leaders on the sales side. And when I went in to my DMs on social media, And started reading because I was trying to figure out kind of what I told you in the beginning of the process. Like, what are people asking? I noticed a really interesting trend, Hmm. which was very few people were actually asking uh, how to build sales teams. (laughs) Like, how do you build SDR programs? Or how do you become an executive, you know, CRO? Or everyone was just like, I like your stuff on LinkedIn. Hmm. How do you write it? How do you think about it? How do you create it? Like, how are you growing? That was completely unrelated to my business. And so I was like, Oh, okay. This is interesting. I'll, um, I guess I'll build a LinkedIn course. And so I built the LinkedIn course after talking to maybe 20 or 30 of those folks who had sent me DMS. That was my first digital product. And it was completely unrelated to my core business. Hmm. That started what, what I do now. And I had never anticipated going down that path. Amazing. And, uh, where do you think Twitter's like pushing you towards right now? Like, uh, cause you were growing on at a massive, at a massive rate. Um, I'm guessing like the problems are a little bit different than the ones that they have on LinkedIn. So what do you see the people on Twitter asking you to do at this very moment? You know, people ask me a lot of things. They ask me how to grow on Twitter, how to write more content, how to write my newsletter. How do I write threads? How do you set up a service business? How do you productize a service? There are a lot of different questions that I get on Twitter. Um, My goal is not to be transactional in nature when people have problems. So for example, Uh, I probably could have built a Twitter course, a newsletter course, a digital products course, and and gone out and sold those things to people who had those questions. Uh, Rather than do that, I look at Twitter as a long-term play for my brand. So I just crossed 150,000 followers. I haven't sold a single thing. I don't promote anything except for my free newsletter. My goal is to figure out how I can leverage Twitter in 2024. Hmm. Like what what does Twitter look like as a revenue sort of as a distribution channel for my business two years from now. Hmm. And to me, I think that's, I'm, I'm totally fine on LinkedIn with my business and other channels, organic SEO, things like that. Um, Twitter is a long game play for me. So to guess where it sort of fits in and how I think about it is almost like just, you know, putting my finger up in the wind and making a really drastic guess because I'm going to see where it takes me. That's interesting. So, so why is Twitter, as opposed to say LinkedIn or other platforms, uh, the long-term play for you? Like where, where does well, that uh, come from? Yeah, well, LinkedIn was a long-term play for me as well. So I think okay. what people don't realize is I released my first product on LinkedIn late 2020. And so I had already been writing for two years hmm. uh, without, I mean, I had, I had landed consulting clients and things like that, but I wasn't doing what you might call traditional selling. Like I wasn't like, hey, everyone, you should buy my course. Um, what was generally happening in terms of sales on LinkedIn was I was passively talking about SaaS sales and healthcare technology and people were finding my website and submitting inquiries. But um, I didn't actively sell on LinkedIn until late 2020 when I sold, sold my first product. So it's more of my level of comfort. And it's also like the very first time I sell something on Twitter, I want it to be a no brainer. I want people to be like, I'm following this guy for three years and he's been giving a tremendous amount of value nonstop for three years. It's not even a thought process. I'm just going to go ahead and buy this versus some people, you know, I'm still pretty new. I've only been tweeting for 10 months. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's, uh, so what I'm getting from you is that it's very much a long game, uh, especially when you get onto a platform and it's not necessarily even about direct selling. It's about uh, building up that uh, goodwill 
and mm-hmm. giving enough value out there. And then um, in the interim, if you do actually come out with a product, you don't even hard sell it. You know, people will just want to buy it based on the amount of value that they given that you've given in the first place. That's right. I don't think people buy. I think people think they buy things because they think there's secrets inside. Yeah. Um, as a buyer of products, I don't think that's true. Um, I've recognized that over time when I buy a product that most of what's inside the product exists for free on the internet. Yeah. And like, I can go find it if I want. I don't pay for info. I pay for aggregation and, and speed. Mm-hmm. And so um, my time is valuable. And therefore, if I want to learn how to do something really well, I want it to be packaged in a very condensed and digestible way. And I'll pay $200 if I can save a couple of hours of time learning how to do something because it's all right there. <laughs> and yeah. so that's how I think about it. I think people are convinced in their minds that like the information is you is ungatherable in any other place, but that's yeah. just not true. Yeah. I heard uh, a, a saying from, I think it was Alex Hormozzi, which was, uh, you know, uh, social media is for information and uh, products are for implementation. Mm-hmm. And when you get a product, it's literally to, to aggregate all that information. You can't really just piece things together on your own. You want it in one simple uh, kind of like place where you can actually take action on it uh, very easily. So you, sure. you did mention something about uh, product. So, or actually not product, but content. And you, I remember you, said, you had something called a content matrix. So, mm-hmm. so can you explain what the content matrix is and maybe throw in like what the suction system is as well? Yeah, I um it's so funny. I, a lot a lot of people love the content matrix. I haven't used it in a long time. Um, but my it was the original way. It kind of came out of a problem that I had, which is where most of my products come out of uh, anyways. Um as I was getting more traction early on LinkedIn, I ran into the same problem that probably a lot of us run into, which is like, what do I write today? What do I say today? What do I put on social media today? And I wanted to get rid of that problem because it causes some anxiety. The better you do on social media, the more you want to produce and the more you sort of feel under the gun or under pressure to continue to produce on a regular basis. And so I thought, okay, let's take a look back at the last 12 months of things that I've written and try and bucket them in in sort of multiple groups. One group is what are all the subtopics underneath my primary topic that I talk about? Mm -hmm. Um, The second thing that I wanted to, to ask myself was like, if I look through my top 100 posts, do they have things in common? And they generally did. They were stories, some were observations, others were a contrarian take. Um, I had a belief that was was not commonly held in the industry or topic. Um, Comparing the past to my topic to how my topic is today in the present. Um, You know, listicles, lists of books and tools and things like that, right? We all know that, that those work for the most part. Uh, And I kind of came away with like six to 10 different structures or formats. And so on the left side of my matrix, I had topics and on the top, you know, of my matrix, I had structures. And so in the morning when I would wake up and this is how I used to write, and I don't write like this anymore, I would just match a topic with a structure and it's much different than staring at a blank screen and ideas just emerge and you just write your headline and then you turn those headlines into different ideas. Gotcha. So what's the uh, writing process now, now that you don't have the content or now that you don't really uh, use the content matrix? Yeah, I have a 10 step writing process that I use. Um, it's, it's grown over time and changed over time. And it kind of all started when uh, Dan Co. I don't know if you know Dan. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, uh, I reached out to him many, many, many months ago. And we had started a relationship because I was on his YouTube podcast and we became friends. And um, I said, hey, man, I'm like, I'm curious as to what your writing process is. And he sent me over like this three or four step process that he went through. And it wasn't the right process for me. It was super helpful. It just wasn't right for me. And so I took that and I massaged it into this larger 10 step process that sort of encapsulates everything that I do. So it's, it's pretty simple. Step one is idea capture. So there are two 30 minute blocks on my calendar every week for me to sit down and ideate. So I, I, I ideate anyways, where it's just like something comes into my mind, I jot it down in Notion, but I actually take the time to be focused on ideation, surfing YouTube channels, reading curated newsletters, checking out blog postings, reading the news, just something to 
get my brain working, right? And so I will throw all of those ideas into Notion. That's sort of step one. Step two is I'll do research. So I'll usually pick one of those topics. So, you know, how to network online, right? Um, I'll do research. I know, I know how I network online. And I think that I can write a good newsletter based on what I do, but it's always nice to find out how other people do things and how, what they do differently and better and worse and things like that. So I'll go out and I'll read tweets. I'll read articles, blogs on, in this example, how to network online. So I'll just do some research and I'll put some tweet URLs and some blog articles into my research tab on Notion. Once I've researched it, I'll open up my newsletter template and I write a newsletter every Saturday at eight in the morning. It's a template. It's the same thing every single Saturday. Nobody notices, but it is generally a problem and a four or five step solution. Mm. So I have a template that I can literally write the headlines and write the newsletter. It takes me less than 45 minutes to write my newsletter every Monday. Once I've written my newsletter, that's step three. I do step four, which is editing. So I'll usually go away for a few hours because I don't like to edit right after I've written. Yeah. And I'll push my newsletter issue through a four question editing process that makes sure I've done things like delivered on the promise, not meandered, put all the different links in the appropriate ways, added visuals, all the things that make a newsletter more compelling. That's step four. Step five is my pre-newsletter CTA. So since my newsletter comes out on Saturday, every Friday I tease it. Pre-newsletter CTA. You know, opening statement, four different things, catchy takeaway. Tomorrow, 36,127 people will learn how to do X. Make sure you don't miss it. Link to the newsletter, right? That's step, I think, five. Step six is a post-newsletter CTA. So every Sunday I say, hey, did you miss yesterday's issue? 36,127 people learned how to do X. You know, go back and make sure you read it. Step seven is where like the, the content writing gets really interesting. Since I have a newsletter topic already picked out, I can then turn that topic into micro content. Yeah. So the first thing that I do is I turn it into a story. And my story has a five-step process, pain, agitate, intrigue, positive uh, future, and solution. So I use those prompts to write a story. Then I turn it into an observation, a contrarian take, a listicle, a present versus future. And then I copy and paste the newsletter into Hype Fury and turn it into a tweet thread. Nice. And then I distribute the tweet thread, screenshot it, turn it into a LinkedIn carousel. And then I publish. And by publishing, what I do is I stagger in my publishing tool. Now I have six to eight pieces of content directly related to a newsletter topic that I stagger over the next six to eight weeks. And since it's a hub and spoke model, I can connect all of those spokes back to the hub, therefore deplatforming my audience off of social media onto my website where they can buy my products and services. And that's step 10. Okay, I gotta I gotta look at this. That was a lot. Real, real act. I gotta look at it in real time. I just uh, subscribed to your newsletter. Looking forward to kind of like seeing this in action, and, and also getting like your newsletters as well. And uh, it, it does remind me of kind of like uh, just like distribution because it's one thing to like create content. It's another thing to actually have it done in a systemized way where you can uh, distribute it to all the different channels. Um, is is there some? Are you actually looking to get into maybe like longer form? Uh, type of content creation, things like podcasting, things like YouTube? Probably not. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe. I never say no. Um, my big mantra on content is do what you like and I like to write. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So it's more like uh, more like blog post writing, doing that every single day, honing your craft and, and just focusing on that and getting really good at that then. Yes. I feel like I'm sure. doing way too much right now. <laughs> I'm doing like podcasting YouTube and like, and also writing in a newsletter. Uh, you know, what you sound, what you're doing right now sounds very uh, structured and also quite simple uh, from a, at least from my perspective of things. Um, yeah, man. Simple actually is way better than, than complicated and trying to like have your hand in like so many hats all at the same time. I just don't like waking up each day without knowing what to do to move the ball forward. Yeah. And so the systems that I've created, essentially, I wake up, I do my thing, go work out, come back. And it's like, I know exactly what I'm doing today. Like exactly. And therefore it's like, when you don't have to think about what you're doing, you can, your brain has more freedom, I think, to be creative. Mm -hmm. And the systems and processes are there when you're not feeling it as a gotcha. safety net. Gotcha. 
Uh, what, what would you say is like one system in your business that has completely changed the way that you've done business that we talked about kind of like your constant system right now? Is there any other systems that come to mind that, uh, that you hold near and dear to yourself? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, I would say the content system is probably, is probably the, the biggest thing that I've done for my business. It's, three X to my daily revenue, two and a half X to my daily revenue. That's not exactly true. Um, and so that's been a huge win for me, almost exactly two and a half X my daily revenue. Um, that's been really big for me. And then another system that's been really big for me is I leverage a tool called black magic on Twitter. Um, it's blackmagic.so, And that allows me to essentially curate a list of favorite people, you know, so I have maybe 20 to 25 Twitter accounts. I really like, and off of the platform of Twitter, I can actually see in one very small window on the side of my, it's a, a plugin mm -hmm. where I can see how many tweets they've tweeted in the last six hours that I haven't replied to. And then inside of the plugin, I can reply in rapid fire. And with one button, I can reply and like their stuff. So two times a day for 15 minutes, I go through my favorites and I, when relevant, reply to all their tweets. Yeah. And I grow really fast just through engagement that way. And so that's something that I've stuck to twice a day. Dude, I, I, I got, you're, you're dropping some like gems right now, especially from like a Twitter angle. I haven't heard of black magic. So I'll send so, you a loom on how it works. Yeah. That'd be so dope. Oh man. That'd be amazing. So in, in the uh, topic of systems, so what do you feel are some systems in your life that have, uh, that have made the most impact on you? Yeah, I think one of the biggest systems that's made an impact on me is is having a virtual assistant. Gotcha. Um, I, that's brand new for me. I think it's been doing it for three months, maybe. Um, I mean, that has allowed me to stop context switching so. Uh, I, I do it so so fewer, so much fewer than than I used to, or so much less. Excuse me, than I used to. I used to like log into email and then someone would need an invoice or I'd log in and someone would need a receipt or they couldn't log into their product account. And instead of it being five minutes, it's five minutes to read the email, five minutes to go figure out why they can't do it. Then it's 20 minutes off of my creative flow. And it just became really, really distracting. So hiring a virtual assistant and then putting together a framework for us to work together was really helpful. I have sort of these process doc plus video framework that I use to make sure that she knows exactly what to do in any given circumstance. That's been really helpful. Um, it's not really a system, but like there are things that I do from a health perspective that I think are helpful. Yeah. I'm, I'm not the healthiest guy in the world and I won't pretend to be, but, um, I love going to hypnosis. So I go to hypnosis every week. Um, that keeps me feeling creative and juiced up and positive and, um, you know, being a one person business when most people are working from home can be relatively lonely. And so yeah. uh, I love having a system for going and, you know, talking my problems away to somebody else. So I always encourage folks make therapy or hypnosis or something part of your personal system, mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter how good you feel. We probably all need it. <laughs> can we, can we talk about this hypnosis thing for a little section sure. right here? I'm sure. very interested in it. So uh, if you're, so hypnosis, are you telling them the things that you're going through and then they are, um, taking you through kind of like this, uh, this process to, I I'm totally agreeing when it comes to this stuff. So like, okay. what's the process of hypnosis and, and what exactly do you do when you're like in that session? Yeah, it's a, it's a process of emptying and filling. So essentially, um, there's a lot of things that we think about in our subconscious that we're not actually that cognizant of where we're just doing our stuff. And like, there's things that weigh on us. It's why sometimes, I don't know if this happens to you, but you might be just having a conversation with someone and suddenly you feel like the kind of anxiety, you feel like shoulders, neck, maybe you're carrying a little bit of stress and the stress is unrelated to the conversation that you're having. It's just something in your subconscious is weighing on you. And, um, I think those things are important to talk through and then try and get rid of. So mm -hmm. essentially when I meet with my uh, hypnotherapist, we talk through things and then he'll put me under hypnosis where we're essentially emptying and we're saying goodbye to those bad feelings, bad habits, bad past experiences, trauma, things like that. Um, that's sort of the beginning of the relationship. That's the, the beginning. And then what you do is you work through a, a process of trying to figure out what you want to fill your brain with. Like, you know, who are you intentionally? What do you want to be? What are the characteristics that you want to focus on instead of some of the previous things you just exited? And so you fill your brain up and your subconscious up with uh, 
And by the way, if any hypnotist is listening, I'm probably doing a really shitty job of describing how it actually works, but this is how I take it as the patient. Um, and it's cool, man. Like it's, it's not like you're like deeply hypnotized. You're like sort of almost asleep. And when you wake up, you feel great. Yeah. Like it's, it's just, um, and then he records it. I get to listen to it anytime I want at home. And it's a great break in between, you know, writing blog posts and stuff like that. Is this someone that you have, uh, say virtual or do you have someone local to yourself? Locally here. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then what happens? Like, let's just say like you move to, uh, you, you said actually before this, uh, you're going to be doing a little bit of a move. Yep. Now, would you still go to the same, uh, hypnotherapist, uh, virtually, or would you find someone yep. new in the, in the area that you would be in? Go, go to him virtually. Okay. Yeah, he does okay. virtual as well. I would like to an intro to yeah, hypnotherapy. He's cool. And, and he's a great out. dude. Okay. Yeah, he's so a great guy. Last question on hypnotherapy. Um, so when, or actually, yeah, when did you start it? And then what kind of benefits have you uh, derived out of it? Yeah. I started it about three months ago. Okay. Um, and it's been, I, I've been in therapy for, I've been in therapy for 16 years. So, and that's not like, and, and by the way, not saying that, actually, that's probably not a good thing to say. Um, the way that I'll, I'll suggest it is I want, I'm trying to say, I don't, I'm not, I, ha I don't need therapy, meaning like yeah. it hasn't been uh, suggested to me. It's not like I'm going through a specific trauma. I don't have a specific mental issue that I'm trying to work through. And, and, and by the way, I'm not, there's no judgment on folks who have those things. Um, I just like to have someone to talk to. And so, uh, I made that decision when I was 25, I'm, uh, you know, 41 now. Uh, so I started that three months ago because I wanted to try something different. I wanted to just see if there was some sort of different outcome from hypnosis. And the thing that I noticed instantly is you, when you go to therapy, there's like a flood of emotions that sort of come out. And then, you know, you kind of come home to your spouse and talk about those things. Whereas like every time I leave hypnotherapy, I feel really positive. So, um, I'll come home and if my wife get into a conversation and one of us happens to say something negative, I'll say like, Hey, let's try and be really positive about that. Let's think about that a little differently. Let's be grateful for that thing. And like, it definitely goes away over the course of the week where you start to revert to some bad habits. Um, but the longer that I go, the longer that I stay in that sort of positive vibe after going. And so for me, it's just like, I don't know. It's almost just like, you know, someone hits you with a wand and you're like really positive and excited for, you know, a couple of days and it, it tends to go away, but it's been longer and longer and longer. But so I guess it's like uh, the the more that you do it, the more you're exposed to it, the the longer that the effects stay. Because what you're doing is you're changing your subconscious mind, essentially. That that's right. what I think is happening. I mean, I'm not an expert, but um, it's cool, man. Like I've tr I try all the kinds of stuff, like acupuncture, all all that stuff, right? Like oh, I'm yeah. interested in I'm in, I'm interested in open in in completely open minded to trying anything that will give me a leg up or an edge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was going to say, it's like, uh, it, it feels to me like what you're doing is, is very proactive. Right. And, and I understand that, you know, some people go to uh, therapy because they are dealing with uh, issues and trauma. And, you know, even for me, it's like, I, I go to therapy because I want to be proactive about the things that are going on inside of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then sometimes, you know, little issues and little traumas come up as a result of me actually sure. going to therapy, right? So, okay, so let's just say like someone wanted to, uh, they're listening to this and they want to search for a reputable uh, hypnotherapist. Uh, they want to do so locally. What would you say is kind of like your, your I guess as you say, your structure towards finding someone that you feel is like legit to help you out with uh, this specific area of the mind because the thing with hypnotherapy is kind of like they're dealing with your mind right yeah yeah it's not something to like mess with whatsoever so how would you go about like finding someone like that i don't have a good uh process but i went through and i just i did it i, I did what i might do before going to an expensive restaurant uh -huh. like my wife and i are foodies and so we travel the world and we eat at a lot of the world's 50 best restaurants that's like a thing that we do as a hobby Amazing. and i i think a lot of those are overrated and some are really, really, really good. Yeah. And before we'll commit to spending a lot of money on a meal, we want to do extreme diligence on that. Right. So like 
every review site, every picture, reading through recent reviews, previous reviews, New York Times reviews, everything, right? Mm-hmm. Before we going to go pop, you know, some few hundred bucks on a good meal. Um, I found this guy the same way. There's probably 15 or 20 of them here in Nashville, but this guy just consistently the be- the most reviews, the best reviews, the most recent reviews. So quantity, quality, and frequency and recency. Like he had all the different sort of four things I look for in reviews. Um, and then I just did what I think anyone should do, which is it doesn't really matter what other people say. I just went and tested them out myself and said like, do I vibe with this guy? And he's cool. He's a Scottish guy. So like cool voice, good accent, you know, made me feel comfortable. And so we vibed. And so I've been going to him for three months and I enjoy it. I, I highly recommend like people don't be afraid of it or, or um, skeptical. Just go check it out. Yeah, no, I, I've actually heard of a lot of uh, studies that are, are coming out for the efficacy of hypnotherapy. And uh, this is something that's interesting to me because a lot of people, when they think about hypnotherapy, and I don't want to turn this whole podcast into like a hypnotherapy podcast, but it is like super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people, when they think about hypnotherapy, they, they think about the guys like, oh, you're getting sleepy and you're going to act like a like a lamb or something like that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But it is it is a uh, an effective uh, tool to change a lot of what's going on in the subconscious. And then what we, what we know about the subconscious is like ninety percent of our behavior is derived from subconscious, is derived from what's happening underneath the surface. So super dope. Uh, definitely going to get your recommendation on that guy uh, cool. right after this. Uh, so I we end off this podcast with a few rapid fire questions. And cool. basically, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. You, you give your answer and then um, and then give like maybe like one or two sentences to, to explain why why you answered it that way. So I'll start with first one, which is uh, which is near and dear to me. So what is the best restaurant that you have been to in the planet on the planet? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, boy. I would say it's one of two. It's either Contramar in Mexico City, which I just love because um, the tuna tostadas, the fish they do there, and the people watching together along with the uh, Palomas are just a phenomenal place. I go every time. I'm a huge fan of Mexico City. I've been eight or nine times and I go every single time. Um, I love, love, love Contramar. And I would say the other one is probably um, a lunch that I had in Barcelona at a restaurant called Cinque Centites. Um it's the most expensive lunch I've ever had in my life. So it should have been good, but it was just very unique and interesting. First smoked champagne I've ever had. Um, a really great piece of foie, which I'm sure there are animal lovers on here who might not like that, but I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, those two, Contramar and Sing Sentites, were two of my favorites. The foie in Spain and Barcelona, just incredible. They just loaded it on. It's, it's like. <laughs> It's like they just like toss. I don't even know what it is. They just have like abundance of them. Um, okay, uh, because you're so uh, in the social media realm, do you have any boundaries around technology and social media? Yeah, uh, not not as good as I should, but um, I generally turn it off at about five o'clock. Um, I'll put it on. I put all my. I have do not disturb on all day. Um, but I check it every once in a while to see what's going on. Um, but usually I'll turn it off about six o'clock and my wife commit to having dinner, uh, watching television, doing a little reading um, without it. Now we're not always good at it. Some of us fail, me and my wife both, but that is a boundary. And then uh, when we go on vacation, I like to work by the way. So it's like, this fits into my personality, but when we go on vacation we generally wake up, have coffee and work for like an hour or two. Um, that we commit to like getting that stuff out of the way in the morning and then shutting down and then we go enjoy our vacation. And so those are the two boundaries that come to mind for me. I, I don't, when it comes to vacations and like traveling, I, I need to work. Like I need to be really to. useful. Yeah. I have to yeah. push the needle forward at least like every single day, like at least like a little bit. Uh, do you work at all in like the weekends at all? Yeah. Or do you I mean, I work like every day. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. but, but, but in bursts, right? So yeah. like, I'll generally take it out. Like I've got looking at my weekend now, I'm like going to work on some slides to update my course. And like, I have it down for an hour from yeah. 1030 to 1130. I'll be done for the day. You know? Yeah. It's like, get it, even just like a little bit of hour, maybe like two hours, you know, I, I really don't mind working every single the day. The weekdays and the weekends are the same for me Yeah, because I work my own business and like, they don't feel that different. Yeah. 
a little bit different for me because I, I got I got a little one. So so the weekends oh, are yeah. like all yeah. about that. Uh, OK, so in terms of uh, actually, here's the next one. What does walking mean to you? Walking. Yes, because I, I, I was watching your Dan Co. Uh, yeah. Interview, maybe not walking. OK, so he's, he, you mentioned the fact that you and your wife you go on, you have like this routine of walking five to you, six miles. Yep. Yeah. Five to six. Is that five to six miles every day? It, it's every day outside when it's not a hundred degrees here in Nashville, when it's a hundred degrees in Nashville during the summer, I will, I have a treadmill. Um, and so I can't run or lift weights cause I have two back surgeries. Uh, so the only thing I can really do is walk. And so when it's nice weather here, we go to Shelby park around the corner from our house. We walk five to six miles every morning. And when it's not nice weather out. I walk on the treadmill every day, sometimes twice a day. And what do those uh, walks do for you? They chill me out. Like they're good. Um, I have a really like, I know people who like to like zone out or listen to music or like think of ideas. I watch movies. Yeah. Like I might walk for 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening on my treadmill. Yeah. It's 90 minutes. I watch eighties and nineties movies. And I just, or true crime, like, you know, murder, murder mystery things. And like, I don't know, I just zone out and just, so, I don't think, I don't think about social media and content creation and shit like that when I'm enjoying myself. You know, you know, the funny thing is that I feel like that's like, <laughs> that's like so type A as well. It's like, you're getting something really like beneficial done for your body. And then at the same time, you're doing something that is like chilling you out at the same time. It's like, you totally. have to do something that's like productive. Totally. Uh, okay. You have two entrepreneurs in the family, you and your wife. Mm -hmm. How do you guys, how do you guys like balance the, the getting away from your business and, uh, getting into kind of like personal intimate time with each other? Yeah. I mean, we spend all day together every day, which is nice. Um, I say we travel mostly and it's not like we wait until we travel to have, you know, personal time, but, um, we like to eat lunch together every day. We dinner together every day. We watch TV together every night. I know that's like not super fit and healthy, but like, I love Schitt's Creek and we like, we like to watch it from start to finish, like yeah. on repeat. And we just think that's fun. Um, and then we do a ton of traveling. So, uh, you know, we'll probably do four to six international vacations every year, uh, alongside multiple domestic vacations. So, you know, we just got back from Mexico city, London, Lisbon, Madrid. I mean, we've been to all those places in the last six or nine months, uh, Edinburgh, uh, my wife just went to Iceland. She's going to Italy upcoming. You know, we're going to upstate New York next week. Like we just, we like to be on the go and checking out new places. And that's part of what not having children allows us to do. Yeah. And, uh, what's one of the, uh, the most favorite places in the world that you just keep on gravitating back to Tokyo in Mexico Tokyo. city. Oh yeah. Tokyo. Yeah. Those are our two favorite places. Yeah. What, Maybe, what is the, I say that, but Spain, Spain's, Spain's there too. So I, yeah. I, I don't want to, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Kind of like children a little bit. Uh, what was what it about Tokyo that uh, draws you back there? It's a labyrinth. Um, you know, we lived in Brooklyn together for, we lived in New York City for six years and we lived in LA for four and a half years. So we've been in big cities. And sure, there are plenty of things to find in those cities. Don't get me wrong. But unlike Tokyo, Tokyo is like, um, you know, every building goes up and then it seems like also goes down into the ground. And like mm -hmm. you can walk into a building. And it looks like a medical building, like a building where there might be like dentists and doctors, but you'll go up like six floors, walk down what looks like the hallway of a medical building, open a door and it's like a dance club. And the other yeah. door is like a sushi restaurant. The next door is like something completely different. And then you'll go down six floors underground and there's like a chocolate store. And it's just like, it's just so, so, it's so many things to figure out. It's like being in a maze with a language that I have no idea how to understand. It's yeah. really fun. The culture is just incredible. I was, I was it's awesome. going to move there as well. Um, it's a great place. Once upon a time. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, last question is going to be, uh, where can people find you and where can people buy your courses? Yeah, they can find me and my courses at my website, which is justinwelsh.me. That's J-U-S-T-I-N-W-E-L-S-H dot me. Awesome. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much for doing this uh, podcast. Really appreciate you. And, uh, and I, I learned a lot. I've been uh, taking notes along the way and uh, definitely going to be using a lot of these for, for my own business. Uh, so, yeah, definitely appreciate it. Thanks, Barley. Cool, man. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah.